We're joined again by Professor Fabio Rojas, who is presenting a pair of lectures today. The first titled Sociology and the Classical Liberal Tradition, Critics of the Market. Professor Rojas. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, nice to see all of you virtually again. Uh, this is Fabio Rojas. I teach sociology in the University. And uh, to fit into the theme with the seminar this week, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the relationship between sociology and classical liberalism. And the discussion will have two parts. So the first part, I will go through some of the major thinkers of classical sociology. And we'll talk about why they were critical of the market. We'll talk about what their ideas were, why they were critical of it. And then in the second part of the discussion, there will be some responses. I'll give you what I think are some uh, responses to these criticisms. And then um, that lecture is called Begin the Dialogue, because after I give you my responses, I'm going to talk about some ways that classical liberals and sociology could start talking to each other in a more uh, constructive uh, fashion. So uh, I'm just going to put it right up front. Um, sociology uh, is often uh, seen as a um, as a academic discipline or an academic community that uh, is pretty critical of markets as a way of uh, solving social problems or organizing social relationships. Uh, I don't think this is a terrible secret. This is actually very well known, and I think most people are very comfortable with that. Um, sociologists tend to be modern liberals. They tend to be progressives who favor a mixed economy. Uh, some are Marxists or part of the left, and they see uh, their research as an explicit or implicit criticism of the market. Uh, in studies of professorial behavior and uh, the politics of academia, uh, researchers have found that sociologists tend to lean uh, democratic more than the general population, and even more than many other academic disciplines. Um, so basically, the idea is that sociology is often seen as an ill-suited partner or not a good match for people who are interested in markets. Um, this is even built into the line lineage of uh, sociology uh, that a lot of sociologists uh, see themselves as being part of a tradition which is essentially at its core uh, opposed to classical economics or laissez-faire economic doctrines. Um, you can see this in the U.S., for example, Albion Small, Robert Park, and W.E. Du Bois, and Ida Wells were all very prominent sociologists who wanted to study how uh, society wasn't working in some way or, or was dysfunctional in some way. And sociology was an analytical tool to help you understand how society wasn't working properly and to propose solutions. In the European uh, context, we see uh, some people like Marx, who are pre-sociology, Durkheim, Tonys, and others, who, um, who saw sociology as a more grounded science than abstract economics. There was an argument in the late 1800s and the late 19th century where a lot of people who were associated with sociology argued that uh, economics was too abstract, too decontextualized, too ahistorical in order to be a very good social science. And so you needed things like historical research or sociology to counterbalance that in the academy. So even in the lineage of sociology, the way that most sociologists think of their discipline, they think of it as a reaction to classical economics and uh, people who defended the market. Uh, so what I want to do today is I want to uh, take uh, the first part of our discussion to really present these kinds of arguments in some detail. I think they're interesting arguments. I think they're important arguments. I'm going to uh, go back to the source of the classical text and talk about why people were anti-market. And then later this afternoon, I'll talk about my responses uh, to some of these issues and how you could build an alternative uh, way of thinking about markets within sociology. So here are the three arguments I'm going to focus on. There are a number of uh, arguments in sociology we could talk about, but these are the ones I think are interesting for today. Uh, number one, the Marxist argument, which is capitalism is inherently exploitative, right? So there's something essentially bad about the uh, so social practice of having uh, business owners, employees. Uh, number two, capitalism wrecks community, or is a very bad form of community. This comes from the writings of people like Emil Durkheim, and then argument number three is that capitalism creates cultural chaos. This is interesting that this argument was uh, offered by uh, Georg Zimmel, the great German sociologist and philosopher, um, who actually liked markets, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but he offered this argument that I think would resonate with many cultural conservatives who are very critical of markets for being very disruptive or disrupting social relationships and debasing culture. Uh, Zimmel offers a very interesting form of that argument that we could talk about. So now what I want to do is I want to go through each of these three classical sociology authors. They all date from the 1800s to the early 1900s. 
but they still resonate today. Uh, the arguments you can think of as a template for other arguments in sociology or other critics of the market. So let's uh, jump into it right now. So the first argument about capitalism being exploitation uh, was offered by many people, was offered by many socialists of the era, and is, is still offered today. It's the Marxist critique. Um, it's interesting, I just want to put in kind of an intellectual history that uh, Marx is not, was not a sociologist in the modern sense of the word. Uh, you know, if you look at the tools of modern sociology, like statistics or kind of empirical research design, he really didn't have it. He's more of a philosopher who talked about social relationships and political economy. Uh, he also predated, right, predated, uh, I got his date of death incorrect in the uh, slide here. So just mentally fix that in your head that he dies actually much later than that. Uh, but the point, I think that should be 1883, not 1843. He didn't die at like 30 some years old. He died when he was, I think like 60 or 70 or something like that. But the point is he predates academic sociology. So uh, nobody even wrote the word sociology as a science until 1850. Uh, Saint-Simon, the writer, he wrote that. Auguste Comte, uh, the French uh, socialist, had this idea of sociology as a discipline uh, in, later in the 1800s. And then the generation of Du Bois, Weber, Zimmel, Durkheim, all those people, that's late 1800s, early 1900s after Marx had died. However, even though he predates sociology, he's considered a big influence on sociology because his theory of class struggle is seen as a template or a blueprint for studying social change in general. So one of the big hypotheses in uh, political science and sociology in terms of studying revolutionary movements or political movements is that they represent uh, the mobilization of a proletariat group uh, and state repression represents the, uh, the actions of a bourgeois class against the proletariats, um, proletarians. And in general, many sociologists, you know, in terms of their basic uh, kind of approach to social life are historical materialists. Not all of them, but many of them are. And many of them draw marks. They really believe that everything boils down to who owns the property and who get and how wealth is distributed in a society. And that should be the basis of understanding social relationships. So even though he wasn't a sociologist in the modern sense of the word, he didn't have a PhD in it, the discipline didn't even exist at the time, but he is seen as a highly influential figure in the field today. And that's why in most uh, history of social thought courses, you'll see him taught. Okay, so what is his, is his basic argument uh, about capitalism? So he has a whole bunch of different arguments about why capitalism is wrong, um, but let's, uh, let's offer a few of them so we can start thinking about them. Uh, in the Communist Manifesto, he offers a very simple argument, which is very interesting and fascinating to think about. He says, in every society, there's a ruling class that exploits the lower class. And uh, not only, I think, is this an interesting uh, piece of social theory that all societies are really built into an upper class and the lower class, but uh, the Communist Manifesto, which offers this idea, is actually uh, a really brilliantly written, um, you know, rhetorically very uh, interesting uh, thing. He says, you know, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Uh, freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, fieldmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed. Right? So he says, look, there's these two groups that struggle in society, one is oppressing the other. So in contrast, in co constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or the common ruin of the contending classes. So basically, that's the first criticism there, which is that all societies, including our society, the industrial society or the capitalist society, uh, is built on class conflict. And it's gonna end in two ways. Either the two parties in the conflict are gonna wreck each other, or it'll give way to a new society. In Marx's point of view, he thought the workers would rise up and create a worker state. Uh, but that's the general uh, thesis of his, which is that societies just naturally have this tension, this built-in tension. And it was the point of social, socialist theory to explain what this tension is about and why it would lead to such struggle and uh, strife. Uh, a second argument that Karl Marx offers, and this is actually a more subtle argument uh, that I think is often underappreciated, uh, but I think really needs to be excavated. He also believed that capitalist labor is exploitative. And when he wasn't talking about uh, conflicting interest groups, uh, so he wasn't like a, a, you know, like a James Madison style thinker. So for example, James Madison, he had this theory that basically 
every society always has people pursuing their interests, good and bad, and there's always going to be people doing bad things to pursue their own personal wealth, and they all just all have to be balanced out. They're like that's the motivation behind the American constitutional framework. Madison was not like that. Basically, he's like, no, no, it's not that. The issue is not that there's always people pursuing their interests. Is that the, the capitalist form of production is inherently dehumanizing. So he has a very big normative claim. He says, you know, when you set up a factory with an owner who takes the profits and the workers who show up every day and work out a wage for that person, that is an inherently exploitative system that is normatively suspect. Uh, from, and uh, this argument was offered in a, a series of papers or uh, you know documents called the 1844 Economics and Philosophical Manuscripts. He says, we have shown that the worker sinks to the level of commodity and becomes the most wretched of commodities. So just, he makes no bone about it. He says, when you work in a factory, you're no different than a hammer. And people are just using you like a hammer or a cog, right? And not only is there this kind of dehumanizing aspect of capitalist labor, there is also um, a normative argument about uh, the nature of paid labor, which is essentially that is something like uh, being stolen from. And here's the direct quote, his, his the work, uh, the work life when you do labor, no longer belongs to him, but to the object. And so basically the idea here that Marx is conveying is that you do work, you do labor, this is called the labor theory of value. It goes into a product, a, you know, a thing, and then the uh, capitalist takes that thing and sells it and they get all the benefits of your labor and you get very little of it beyond your very small and pitiful wage, right? So let me uh, summarize, and there's a lot more to Marx. We can talk about alienation theory, commodification, and commodity fetishism. These are all kind of big terms for Marx. Uh, but I just want to summarize the major points so that you kind of understand where uh, a lot of socialist and Marxist theory comes, comes, comes from, which is number one, uh, social life is about conflict, right? So if you say something like, you know, look, uh, look at how uh, capitalism has proceeded, People say that's an illusion. There's always exploitation. There's always some conflict kind of brewing under the surface. Um, they'll even say things like capitalism has contradictions. Like these things are unstable. They're not going to work out. Uh, number two, capitalism is about expropriation. This is like the basic uh, Marxist uh, normative claim about capitalist societies. It's not even about inequality. It's not even about the fact that you know um, the bourgeoisie have more money than the workers. It's not even about that. It's even the process of even paying somebody, of having somebody be uh, a wage worker is inherently dehumanizing and is uh, really draining people of their value, right? Uh, and if you were here for the film lecture uh, where we discussed The Matrix, this actually comes up in The Matrix film quite a bit. And uh, eventually this is unstable. Like this is not a desirable system, a system where a small number of people own the most property and people work for them as a wage laborer. Uh, that system is bad and eventually it's going to break up and the workers will rise up and they will set up their own social estate, which will no longer have exploitation. Instead, everything will be jointly and communally owned. Uh, things will be redistributed in a just and fair fashion. There'll be very good social programs to make sure that everybody is taken care of. So that's kind of the Marxist critique in a nutshell, which is capitalism, like most societies, is really about conflict. Capitalism specifically is a form of expropriation that's normatively suspect, and the whole system is going to come crashing down anyway. So we should really look forward to the socialist state where, uh, you know, uh, committees of workers will, in a more just fashion, uh, redistribute wealth. All right, now let me talk about uh, two people who are core to uh, the sociological tradition. Two people are very influential that you may not know about because you're not in the sociology program. The first is Emile Durkheim, who was uh, a leader in establishing sociology. If you, were to, if you were to ask any sociologist, name the top two or three most influential people in the discipline, in the history of the discipline of sociology, Emile Durkheim's name would almost certainly come up almost every single time. Uh, he lived from 1858 to, to 1917. Uh, he was super influential because he wrote many canonical texts in sociology, The Rules of Sociological Method, Suicide, which is a study in self-harm, uh, The Division of Labor and Society, which we'll talk about. Uh, in uh, France, he was uh, crucial for organizing sociology as a discipline. You know, he really promoted the idea of having classes and graduate programs and research projects in sociology. And I believe he uh, founded the first uh, French sociological journal, 
Nane sociology. I apologize for my bad French, but you know, it's just the annals of sociology, and he was really instrumental in that. And he also uh, was uh, instrumental in helping out uh, people related fields like anthropology, like Marcel Mauss and other uh, influential academics. So he was a very focal figure in both anthropology and sociology. And yes, he was a critic of markets. Uh, he wasn't a, a socialist in the way that uh, Marx was. He was not a revolutionary socialist. He did not believe that you know the workers were going to rise up. But he de definitely believed that capitalism had a lot of problems. That some form of maybe democratic socialism or incremental socialism was probably the answer. Um, and even though most of his books are not explicitly political, where he says, you know, here's my plan for better France or something like that, he does have a few books like that, but most of them are not like that. Uh, his uh, cri criticisms of the market definitely uh, do come out in uh, many of his writings. So to understand like the Durkheimian critique, um, you know, and why uh, Durkheim was skeptical of markets, you have to dig in and you have to understand a little bit about how sociological theory is built. And so for Durkheim, he really believes that there's an interesting relationship between the self and the larger society. He believed that what the larger society does is that it regulates the self. Uh, and basically one of his big, uh, I think very important contributions to, so uh, to sociology is understanding the society is varying how much they regulate individuals. So you can live in a society where you're, where you're tightly regulated or you can live in a society where you're not regulated and he called that anomi, right? Anomic, you know, it, you're in a nomic state, you're not being regulated. And his opinion, uh, and I think there's some merit to this opinion, is that in a highly uh, unregulated state, and he didn't mean government regulation, he didn't mean like a bureaucratic regulation, but in a society where there are cultural norms that strongly tell you what to do, uh, that could be a bad thing for people. And why was that? Well, he said, well, people are filled with all kinds of good and bad emotions. And without external forces to balance out those emotions, you might do bad things to yourself and to other people, right? Uh, like a really simple example is that a lot of religions have a rule that say, thou shalt not steal. That's literally in the Ten Commandments and it's in the Old Testament. But without that rule and without a set of institutions that really instill that rule in individuals, you might start stealing things and doing bad things to people. Uh, when I teach Durkheim to undergraduates, I often use the example of celebrities to harm themselves. Right, so you know they may grow up in a very restricted environment. They make a lot of money as a you know a rock musician or a movie star, and then they start damaging themselves in all kinds of ways because there's no regulation of their emotions. There's a lot of self damage. So uh, this was Durkheim's probably uh, one of his biggest contributions. This this interesting discussion of the relationship of the self and the larger society, and this leads to his uh, criticism of market based society. And this is a very interesting. Uh, argument that he offers, I think you should all think about very carefully. He wrote a very influential book, which is very famous in sociology and in many other disciplines called The Division of Labor and Society. And he starts with a very Adam Smith kind of position. He actually admits like the division of labor is a good thing. Like thank God for the division of labor. You could not run a factory. You could not do all these different things in a modern society without a modern division of labor. However, and here's the rub for Durkheim, uh, the modern division of labor leads to a very particular type of social connection. What happens is that people are no longer uh, connected through intimate bonds. Instead, they're connected through transactions. When I teach Durkheim and I teach this idea, I say, you know, imagine growing up in a neighborhood for 20 years and then you go to college. You're going to be close to the people in that neighborhood for your whole life. If you get sick, they may take care of you. If you have a personal problem, you can talk to your neighbors and get some advice or a friendly ear. There's like these close personal bonds that come from sustained contact with each other that are very beneficial uh, for people. And uh, what the uh, market society does is that it replaces those or at least shifts some of that over to market-based interactions where you say, okay, well, you know, I know the guy's Subway Sandwiches. Uh, we have a relationship. I may smile at him as he makes my sandwich. I'm grateful that he's opened up a restaurant for me to eat at. But I wouldn't, um, you know, go to him if I had a personal problem, right? I wouldn't go to church with that guy. You know, like the guy at the gas station or subways is just providing a service. And we're connected. And this is one of Durkheim's points, which is it's not that capitalism makes you disconnected. It's that it shifts you to a transactional mode of connection, connectedness, which no longer has the positive attributes of the kind of small uh, community bonds that we had in earlier eras. Um, and uh, because of this, living in a capitalist economy can trigger all kinds of anxiety. This is from the book Division of Labor. 
He says, but what brings about the exceptional gravity of this state, and by this state he means anxiety or, or very strong emotions, is the heretofore unknown development that economic functions have developed in the last two centuries. He means industrialization. Like once you have industrialization, that heightens your anxiety. And he says a form of activity, industrialism, which has assumed such a place in social life, cannot maintain this unruly state without resulting in the most profound disasters. It is a notable source, source of general demoralization. Right? So he says, all the moral rules we have to govern our lives, all the things that help us manage our anxieties and be better people, the market order just wipes all that out. Just wipes all that out and creates a lot of anxiety. So for Durkheim, uh, the big issue is that people need moral regulation. And he didn't mean that in a bad way. It's just like, you need to be part of a community that sets some order, some structure for you in a positive way. Uh, Industrial leads to displacement, recession, and more. So in the sense of uh, when people industrialize, they create these, uh, these uh, business-based uh, transactions that no longer provide more order to people. And that leads to a loss of moral regulation and demoralization. And uh, by demoralization, he simply meant, you know, a lack of a moral order, right? Like the guy in some ways is not gonna tell you how to live better. Uh, the gas station attendant is not going to tell you to be a better family man or to be a better student. That's something that's going to come from your close community. And there's a lot less of that in industrial capitalism. Okay, third, I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, Georg Simmel, who lived around almost exactly the same time, 1858 to 1918. He was a very influential philosopher slash sociologist. His PhD was actually in philosophy, but essentially he wrote sociology. Uh, and he was, he's very influential. He's probably the most important sociologist you've never heard of. Most sociologists know about him, but outside of sociology, he's kind of unknown, but he's like a cult figure because he's had a big impact on cultural studies, social network analysis, and other forms of social research. And the interesting thing is that Zimmel actually had a lot of good things to say about capitalism. Uh, he, he thought that uh, capitalism was very liberating. He wrote a book uh, called Philosophy of Money, which is critical of capitalism, but also has sections that are very positive about it. For example, he will say things like, one good thing about the money economy is that it releases you from having to, to be subservient in a feudal system, right? So in a feudal system, you know, you live on the manor and the aristocrat demands that you uh, grow food for them or they contribute physical goods. But a money economy means that you can just pay your taxes and go along with your daily life. Uh, you know, it liberates you, you can move from town to town. Uh, urban centers are places of individual diversity. He says all these great things, but the uh, typical uh, trademark of a Zimmel book or a Zimmel article is that he always looks at the other side. He says, well, capitalism does all these great things, but on the other hand, also has these problems as well that you can pick up. So now I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about one of his uh, negative criticisms or negative points about capitalism, which I think ties into conservative arguments about markets and the roles in social relations. And his, uh, one of his big ideas about culture was that every society has some sort of ideal goal, logic that they all aspire to, and that culture is a way to uh, express this vision and to guide people towards that uh, ideal state. Um, so this is a, an excerpt from, uh, from the essay, The Conflict in Modern Culture. He says, in every single epoch, the central idea resides wherever the most perfect being, the most absolute and medical physical phase, reality joins with the highest of values. I will indicate the great, the great I will indicate with the, the greatest brevity a few of these central ideas. From Greek classicism, it was the idea of being, or the uniform, the substantial, the divine. For the Christian Middle Ages, they placed instead the concept of God, people are searching for God. In the Renaissance, the places come to be occupied by nature. So he's like, if you look at different historical eras, you look at different historical eras, uh, what you discover is that people have an, an ideal, a value that people are striving towards and uh, cultural, uh, you know, our ideas, our music, our literature, uh, what, we, what we make physically uh, and culturally tries to reflect these ideals, these ideals. So uh, what is uh, Dur uh, Zimmel's uh, critique of modern society is that modern culture is a blob. It is confusing, it's discombobulating, it is uh, very messy. So if you know a lot about conservative social theory, this is an argument that comes up over and over. 
which is one reason that uh, conservative, social conservatives were not happy with the market order, is that they see modern culture as chaotic. And this, and this reflects exactly Zimmel's main point. So let me read to you what Sybil wrote about modern culture. He said, the basic impulse behind contemporary culture is a negative one. Like, don't restrain me. That's what he's saying. Don't restrain me. Don't tell me what to do. I get to do my own thing. And this is why, unlike men in all these earlier epics, we've been for some time now living without any ideals at all. If you were to ask educated people today by what ideals they live, most would give a special answer, specialized answer derived from their occupation. So you say, well, you know, what do you, you know, what's your life about? It's like, well, you know, I work, you know, I work as a teacher. It's like, no, no, but in a bigger sense. It's like, no, no, I work as a teacher. And, and uh, this is also from Zimmel. And what are we to make of the widespread search for originality among contemporary youth? So he's kind of going to a grouchy old man post where he says, the problem with kids today, he says, often is only for vanity, the attempt to become a sensation for both for oneself and others. So he says, the issue with youth today is that they're all trying to be individuals, they're trying to create attention, and they're trying to become a sensation. And I would say Zimmel would love Instagram. He would love Instagram. He said, look at all those social influencers on Instagram. That's exactly what I'm talking about. They have no substance. They're all just trying to use technology in order to get attention for themselves. Uh, that, that's the Zimmel critique. Right. Oh, so I mistakenly wrote uh, summarizing Durkheim's critique. That should be Zimmel's critique. Uh, his first point is culture is about the expression of ideals, right? So every society has some set of ideals that is expressed in it. He gave you multiple examples. Like he says, in, in Greek life, it is about something defined or uniform or logically perfect. You know, you look at a Greek statue and you say, wow, they're really trying to convey somebody who has a perfect physical body in some way. Or you can think of Greek mathematics as being abstracting numbers and logic in a perfect way. Uh, you know, in the medieval, medieval society in the Middle Ages, it was about the search for God and, you know, and being sacred. Uh, within the Renaissance, you know, it's the exploration of nature and science, and the Renaissance reflects that. And so Zimmel says that's what culture is often about. But the problem with modern culture is that it's too individualistic. You know, you're allowed to choose your own thing. And that's, that's a problem, that's a problem. So for example, he might point to modern people who say, well, you know, the problem is you don't have a good religion. The problem is that you're just picking religion from a buffet table. And uh, conservative critics of modern religion will often say this, that they say, the religion isn't really a religion in the sense that's providing you values. It's you treat it as a buffet table. You just choose the religion or the religious practice that makes you feel good without thinking about what the deeper point of the religion is or what sort of disciplining or enriching properties the religion or these rituals may have for you. And instead, people then define their identity in terms of their uh, reputation and their income. Right? I want to be a sensation. I want to be big on social media. I want to make money uh, as much money as possible. And the big, um, the big take-home point uh, for somebody like uh, Zimmel is that modern culture is a mess. It is a, it is a mess. Um, it's just about the expression of individual desires and wants. It doesn't have some sort of value that could cultivate or enrich people. Um, you know, when I teach this to students, they'll say, isn't this a lot like the postmodern analysis of culture? The answer is completely correct. Uh, and one of the key tenets of postmodern social and cultural theory is that modern societies uh, allow people to glue together different art forms or different cultural forms uh, that just express whatever that person wants to do. It doesn't really express any underlying truth or beauty. It's just kind of a mishmash of different things. They would say things like, for example, look at uh, you know streaming services. Everybody can get their own personalized movies or TV shows. Uh, you know, social media is a personalized form of literature. Like you could just write your own little news feed, and only you and your couple of followers will do it. There are echo chambers where people separate themselves into different things. And so, modern society is a big mess. It is a big cultural mess. And so, this is an interesting point in sociology where classical sociology, social conservatives, and postmodernists all come together, and they all look at modern culture and they say, "What a mess." This strive towards individual is creating a messy, uh, diced up, recycled culture, which is really weird and bizarre and not really, uh, not really as enriching as it could be. All right. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do later today is uh, I'll review these three uh, criticisms 
uh, we're the three criticisms are one, Marx uh, believes that uh, markets are exploitative, that they're unstable, they're normatively suspect. Uh, Durkheim believes that uh, markets create very thin social bonds that really don't um, regulate people, that really don't help them out in the same way that like a small community of intimate people, of intimates may help uh, people. And Zimmel, kind of representing a kind of a conservative critique of modern culture says, you know, modern culture is way too individualistic. It's too, way too fractured. It doesn't provide guidance or express some central ideal in the way that earlier cultures did. did. And now I'm going to respond to that later today. And then I'll talk about what the alternative is. Like after you've heard these criticisms, what are some actually uh, interesting and more constructive ways to build a bridge between sociology and classical liberalism? So uh, we've kind of reached the end of our uh, discussion there. Uh, maybe Jason, we could then uh, then go to um, the Q and A. So I um, there you go. So that let me good. let me st do the stop sharing, and then uh, we'll just go through the Q and A. You can moderate the uh, questions. Great, sounds good. So first, what role did rapid technological change play in Marx's criticism of markets? Oh yeah, yeah, um, so um, yeah, so uh, Marx uh, drew on technological change in a couple of ways. So first of all, first is a metaphor, right? So he looked at industrialization, he saw technical change and said, people are being turned into machines. And this is a common theme in all social theory which is uh, people use the technology of that era as a metaphor for understanding what's happening in that era, right? So, uh, you, know, and, you know, if you were present for the movie discussion a couple of days ago, like the Matrix does that, you know, uses computers in the world of simulations as a way to talk about social relationships, right? So first of all, technology is a model for thinking about social relations. Then a second way that technological change uh, impacted Marx's theory is in that it really accelerated the demise of an earlier form of life, right? So it accelerated the demise of agriculture. Um, also, he talked about Britain a lot in some of his uh, writings. He talked about the, um, the, um, uh, the, the collapse of the wool economy. You know, so a lot of people were invested in wool and agriculture and exporting wool. And then, you know, uh, machinery kind of made that uh, a less pressing uh, economy and people were displaced, right? So uh, it's not only a metaphor, but it's also kind of a causal factor in a lot of Marxist arguments. How much does Marx have to say about concerns of power dynamics? Uh, yeah, he definitely talks about power dynamics a lot, mainly within the, there are two ways he talks about them. First of all, there's obviously the power dynamic between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. It's pretty clear that in the way he describes the social world, that if you own the means of production, if you own the factories or you own the farms, whatever the means of production in that society is, you have a disproportionate amount of power. You have a lot of bargaining power in that society and that allows you to, to get more power uh, and compared to other people. Then, um, this is not explored as much, but it definitely comes out in a number of his writings. He definitely talks about the fact that political power is based on economic power. So for example, uh, he saw colonialism and Engels, Engels, his uh, famous partner, also made this argument quite strongly. He said, look, you know, you think colonialism is a political thing. It's not, it's just the bourgeoisie all over again. And the reason you have colonialism is because in domestic markets, you've exploited people as much as you can. You gotta go find new markets and new places to exploit. And that's why you would encourage, uh, that's why the bourgeoisie would allow themselves to be taxed and whatnot, so they can build a colonial system to then spread this exploitative system around the world and actually, uh, in sociology, that is called world systems theory. So there was a scholar named Emmanuel Wallerstein, who I believe passed on recently, or he's very, very old. And he's the one who took Engels' uh, basic point about colonialism, and built a whole theory out of it, saying the entire world is built on a core periphery, that's what he called it. There are core Western nations that are dominated by the bourgeoisie. There's a global proletariat, and those global proletarians are exploited by the colonial powers. And even now that colonialism is gone as a formal political system, those dependency relations still exist and they structure global relationships. So students who are in political science, you probably heard some version of this argument, 
saying that the world is a core periphery system. The dominant, uh, you know, uh, wealthy Western European powers still maintain uh, their dominance over the rest of the world. And that's just kind of where we're at right now. How have theories of social conflict developed within sociology across its history? Yeah, that's a really great question. So uh, with reference to this lecture, um, there, there are a lot of people who are still basically Marxists. Like, so there are a lot of people who say, you know, um, at base, if there's a conflict that's worth talking about, there's probably an element of class conflict in it, or it is a form of class conflict. So there's definitely a branch of people who uh, believe that. Then uh, Max Weber, who I'm actually not going to talk about very much um, uh, in this lecture, just not because he's not interesting, he's actually quite fascinating, but he said, you know, there's more to life than just class conflict. There are other kinds of conflict. Uh, so for example, he, there's a famous section where he says there are three types of conflict. There's class-based conflict, there's conflicts over status or social order. So it doesn't have to do with ownership of property, but just higher honor. So think about, say, for example, uh, within a religious order, like the older clerics within the religious order repressing or having a conflict with, with the younger people in the religion. It's not about owning things, but they do have a higher status they're trying to defend, right? Uh, he also said uh, political conflict is different than class conflict. So obviously a class-based group, by which you meant a group of people who share an economic trajectory or relationship to the market, they can clearly mobilize to grab political power, but there are lots of groups that are not class-based in any sense. So for example, there's an argument amongst uh, political scientists and sociologists about what the abortion, uh, anti-abortion movement is all about. So the Weberians would say, no, it's a purely you know, symbolic conflict. Like people really have a normative problem with this issue. Then other people say, no, no, it's just the ruling class, the ruling wealthy class mobilizing uh, evangelical voters in order to promote their interests, using abortion as a wedge issue. So that argument is very close to the Marxist point of view. And then the Weberians say, no, no, it's not just a wedge issue, it's a genuine uh, conflict. Uh, th those uh, two uh, theories do not obviously exhaust every theory of conflict that you come up with in sociology, but they do show two uh, diverging paths of thought, which is uh, to say, okay, social conflict really is about class in one way or another. Uh, it could be racial conflict, that's really class conflict in disguise, or gender conflict is really class conflict in disguise. Engels actually had a very famous uh, uh, essay on the family where he makes that argument where he says, you know, a lot of gender division is just really capitalist repression in disguise. Uh, and then other people would say, no, that's not true. You know, there's the independent logic to uh, say gender or race that is not reducible to class conflict. Um, yeah, and of course, political conflict. So this is another thing, like a Marxist would say, wars are just class conflicts in disguise. Whereas uh, maybe a modern political scientist would say, not really, there could be genuine national interests right, that are pursued, that are not pursued just to make wealthy people happy, or, you know, people just don't create wars in order to pay off wealthy, uh, you know, web arms dealers or something like that. Instead, there could be genuine uh, ideological conflicts or conflicts of, of sovereignty uh, that are not class-based, right? So I hope that I've sketched out, like, the range of ways that you could think about conflict. Yes, class conflict is one of them, but there are other kinds of conflicts that I think are worth thinking about. On the same theme, Alonso asks, uh, uh, how much of this is ignoring the way that things have always been? So don't humans always feel like their time is a tumultuous one, full of conflict? Uh, and he says that he's thinking about ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, uh, and similar sorts of examples. Uh, is this sort of conflict that's getting described by sociologists anything new or uh, are, are they paying sufficient attention to historical cases? Yeah, so uh, I'll give you a couple of answers to that. So Marx would say, right on, Alonzo, you're completely correct. I predicted this. All societies have conflict. And I, Karl Marx, have the solution, and it's called socialism, right? So he's very clear in Communist Manifesto. He says, this is endemic, and the problem is who controls the mode of production, and the only way to get around that is to give everybody control of the mode of production. Like that's his answer to your problem. Um, and then um, kind of you can step back and say, okay, I'm not interested in what Marx in particular thought, but just in general, how do we think about this issue that conflict tends to be ever present? 
And that gets to a debate in social theory that is very interesting, which is, are you a conflict social theorist or a consensus? So that you'll find that in a lot of introductory textbooks. You'll say, you know, is your theory society about conflict or is your theory society about consensus? So for example, when somebody says, you know, I'm really interested in how uh, gender inequality is found all over the place and how men harm women uh, often quite badly, uh, you say that's a conflict theory, right? Because you're starting from uh, the starting point that there's uh, an inherent, uh, uh, you know, conflict, uh, a lack of shared interests and so forth. And then there are people who say, no, it's all about consensus. So for example, Durkheim was really at heart a consensus theorist because Durkheim really did believe that societies do build moral and values, moral systems or value systems that help promote social solidarity and cooperation. And people don't use that conflict consensus theory so much anymore, but I still think it's useful to think about the issue you talked about, which is when you look at a conflict, do you see that as an exception to the rule? or as something more common. So one thing that's interesting thing uh, about, you know, classical liberal thought uh, is that, you know, um, there is it's a little bit of both. Like classical liberals see an inherent conflict between certain people. Like I have my interest and I have, there's your interest. And I might ask uh, the state to regulate my interest over other, your interests, right? So that's like a conflict approach. And then Adam Smith, you know, is essentially a consensus theorist. You know, Adam Smith said, look, you know, the way we solve problems is through trade not through violence, right? And so uh, that lens uh, is not the only lens and can be counterproductive if you really stick somebody in one box where they don't fit. But at least it gives you a little bit of guidance to say, look, you know, uh, consensus and conflict is a spectrum. And you, you can ask how your social theory uh, sees the world. And uh, definitely in the history of sociology, conflict theories tend to be a little bit more popular than consensus theories. What is cultural Marxism and why is it such a concern on the right and especially the alt-right? Oh yeah, so, um, okay, so this is gonna get into the nitty gritty of the history of Marxism. And if there are any Marxists who are watching, I apologize ahead of uh, time. I, I, I'm almost certainly gonna get some details wrong, but I hope that I will uh, convey the general sense. So if you read Marx or somebody who says they're an orthodox Marxist, right? Uh, usually they say things like, um, you know, uh, everything reduces down to economic relations. Uh, there's a passage in one of Marx's texts where he says, society has a base and a superstructure, right? Like, and the base is economic relations. Like, who owns this piece of land? Who has the right to collect money for this service? Who, you know, who gets to grow the food? Who gets to decide who gets to eat it, right? And so a really orthodox Marxist would say, well, everything just boils down to that on some level. And uh, in a very brief phrase, he didn't really expound on this very much, but Marx did say in one paragraph, he said, you know, all the other stuff, like what is government, what is culture, what are morals, what are ideology, they're all a superstructure that's built on top of this base. So some social theory teachers will call it like a cake model, like there's the first level of the cake and then the icing. So a lot of things that we think about as being important are not that important, really icing on the cake is all the economic mode of production that really matters, right? So over time, uh, people who were Marxists decided that maybe that was too rigid of a way of looking things, that was too uh, inflexible. It did it, so for example, Raymond Williams, who's often uh, considered one of the big figures in cultural Marxism, he was a literary critic. Um, he wrote a great book, a short book which you should read, uh, I think called Marxism in Literature or something like that. Maybe Jason, you wanna look that up real quick and we can put it in the comments. Uh, he says, okay, you know, maybe, you know, we're all Marxists, you know, this is, this is Raymond Williams speaking, he says, but, you know, we can admit that maybe that was a little too rigid, that, you know, culture can be a place where there's some more agency, uh, where people can uh, dispute things more, they can dispute the capitalist order, uh, and literature can be a place where uh, the, the given order can be critiqued, pulled apart, explained, and that can be a basis for social change. I think it's called Marxism in literature, I'm not sure if that's correct. Um, yeah, it is correct. So it's Marxism and Literature. It's a short book. It's actually very well written. It explains his argument very well. And so that style of uh, Marxist argument, you know, is called cultural Marxism because it creates a space where culture and ideas and ideology matter a little bit more than in a very strict orthodox Marxist perspective. And why do people on the right or the all right obsess about this? Well, it's because it's, it, it's because, you know, traditional Orthodox Marxism is kind of on the wane, 
right? Like there aren't too many people who will turn on the radio and they'll say, yes, we have to nationalize General Motors, right? You know, we have to nationalize this or that. Rather, most of Western politics these days ranges from uh, slightly conservative to slightly liberal, right? Like, should we increase healthcare spending more or less? Should we tax the rich more or less? You know, you don't see a lot of people saying, no, let's nationalize everything. So the main game in town then switches to these cultural arguments, right? And so there was a generation of, of Marxist writers and scholars who said they were cultural Marxists. And uh, this became very prominent in some areas. So it became a focal point for people on the right who are obsessed with Marxists and uh, their effects on uh, different parts of society. Uh, personally, I'm not too worried about cultural Marxists. <laughs> it's just not something I think about uh, very much, but it is, it is a thing and some people do obsess about it. But definitely educate yourself and read that book uh, to get an insight in that, into that way of thinking or that tradition of writing. Would you say that we have actual empirical examples of true, in principle and in action, liberal and socialist societies? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and so um, it's, it's actually a very deep question because in order to get to either end, to have the totally market-based voluntary society or to have the totally social society, you have to assume that either you can do away with the state or you can do away with markets. And, uh, and uh, you have to ask yourself, like, how far can you go in either direction? Um, so uh, so I, think, I think the answer would be we actually do have societies that have abolished markets in the normal sense, even though they have black markets or underground economies. So for example, like, it is honest to God true that you cannot start your own corporation in North Korea. Like, it is actually true. Uh, it is actually true there is a Politburo that makes decisions about, you know, how much toilet paper you get, how much food you get, that sort of thing. There is an extraordinarily limited zero or close to zero amount of private property. Uh, I, I'm sure there must be some form of black market or underground market in North Korea because there are in almost all societies. Um, you know, and, lot, and North Korea is not the only example. Like lots of societies, especially in the 20th century, did experiment with going far in that socialist direction. Um, people will say the U.S. is a laissez-faire society. Uh, we can argue about terminology, but I think uh, Esping Anderson, the sociologist, had a really great way of saying it. It's like, these are capitalist welfare states. You know, so they do have capitalism, they do have markets, but there's a fair amount of, you know, regulation, there's a fair amount of taxation. Um, you know, and people will say, you know, Reagan pulled back the state in the 1980s. Like, that's just empirically not true. Budgets were never cut. Uh, maybe the way to say what Reagan did is that for some industries, some things were deregulated, but still there's a lot of regulation in all these industries. You know, uh, I don't think we're close to a Nozick style utopia of a minimal state. However, it, it does bear saying that there are some societies which are stateless, uh, but they tend not to be industrial societies. They tend to be pre-industrial societies, very small societies. Um, and so I think that's the range of things, which is uh, what's really the major argument is uh, how do you want your capitalist welfare state society to look? Uh, going towards a hyper liberal direction is just probably not on the table. Uh, some people want to go in a socialist direction, but I don't think that's on the table anymore. Is there a connection between uh, anime and anarchy in the sense that oh. uh, under uh, enemy, there's a, a, a sense of lack of rules, and anarchy, there are no rulers. Yeah, so uh, they, they are clearly related concepts, but they're, they're different in a couple important ways. So they're related in the sense that they're about a lack of, like something goes away, right? And those two concepts are about something important going away. So for anomy, the only thing that it says is that, you know, moral rules have been relaxed. Like all this is like, people waving, wagging their finger at you at church and telling you to behave, your parents telling you to behave, your pastor, your teacher, or your mom, your dad, all these things are gone in anarchy and you're kind of on your own. Uh, what anarchy refers to is specific. Thing. So there are some people use the, an, the word an about abolishing hierarchies, abolishing corporate hierarchies, government hierarchies, gender hierarchies, racial hierarchies. Then amongst other kinds of anarchists, they say, no, it's only about getting rid of states. 
and there was to be regulations and rules, but uh, state, states would be gone, right? So that's how, so they're both common concepts and they're about the release of a regulation. Anarchy is about moral regulation. And depending on what flavor of anarchism we're talking about, anarchist social theorists would say, you know, this is about hierarchy in general, right? So that'd be like the Chomsky style left anarchist and the right wing anarchist, which that's the term some people use to say, no, I'm just against states. Uh, I would, you know, I'm okay with other kinds of hierarchies popping up. So to draw on another question, does that mean that there is a commonality between Marxism and anarchy in their anti-political bent? Yeah, this is actually a very subtle question. So um, I'll give you the surface level answer and the deep level answer. Um, the, the surface level answer is that they're not the same because most Marxists, um, for example, they would say things like, I'm really good, I'm really cool with the Workers Party making a lot of decisions. I'm cool with the, with, the, with councils of workers owning factories, or not owning them, but managing them. And there would have to be some hierarchy there, like I'm cool with that, right? Uh, and Marx is clearly cool with that. He was very cool with kind of our, you know, workers' parties and workers' councils running things. And a really hardcore anarchist would probably say, I don't, that's not quite what I signed up for. But on a deeper level, maybe Marx and the anarchists would come together because Marx would, in his writing, said, okay, initially, uh, what you're going to need is you're going to need a state to manage things. But after a while, you're no longer going to need hierarchy because the only reason we had hierarchy was capitalism in, this, in the first place. Once we get rid of that, we will, we're not going to need it anymore, right? So then he called that later stage communism, right? So like really hardcore communists and anarchists would see a lot of commonalities with each other um, more than they might admit. But still, I still think there are differences. Even there, like if you really read them very carefully, you know, uh, the anarchists might be suspicious of, you know, workers' parties at all. They might, you know, envision even more radical decentralization than a, like a Marxian communist would be or something like that. Uh, you know, they might be suspicious of the socialist state being an intermediate point between capitalism and some end state. So there would be differences, but I think there's also some commonalities. You said that many contemporary sociologists believe in some form of historical materialism. Why do you think that is? Uh, what's the best evidence of it? Oh yeah, so, um, you know, uh, what, why do they believe it? I think it's actually, I think it's one of uh, Marx's more intuitive hypotheses, right? It may not be correct, it may be wrong, but if you were to say something like, you know, social relationships really reflect how we gather food, how we bake it, how we create material wealth. That's not a crazy hypothesis to think about, right? Like, so I think, and I think a lot of people like walking on the street would have some sort of uh, version of that in their heads, right? Like, like you know, the person who has the money controls the most things. Uh, it's not a crazy, uh, not a crazy hypothesis. Uh, and then, you know, what's the evidence for the fact that a lot of sociologists believe this? I would say, look at uh, sociology theory uh, syllabi, right? They, they teach it all over the place. It is uh, a theory that's talked about very often, maybe not as much as it used to be, like the 70s and 80s were kind of the high point of academic Marxism and sociology, but the theory lives on in many different ways. So, uh, you know, I, I don't have a specific number. I can't tell you what percentage of, um, you know, um, sociologists have sat down and said, yes, my theory of history is historical materialism. But I would say that a lot of it heard it in graduate school. Maybe it's like a tacit assumption a lot of them carry a lot of people who teach social theory probably buy into it. Professor Steve Davies talked about uh, liberal theories of class conflict. So could you say a little bit about the way that liberalism might think about class? Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, he's a great lecturer. So <laughs> I always enjoy it when I listen to him. I wish he could like narrate my house. Like his voice is so great. Like just me walking around the house, like to have him talk about it. Yeah, but there's this interesting um, uh, tradition of thinking within classical liberalism and libertarianism, which is all about uh, thinking about interest groups and to say that there are certain people who have a certain investment in the system the way that it is. Um, and so uh, some people say, you know, people who work for the state might be one, or maybe capitalists who have an investment in certain regulations. Like that's a, a group of people who have an invested interest in a certain uh, position. And I've heard some, uh, you know, classical liberal historians say things like, 
you know, Marx borrowed or was influenced by some of these proto early theories of rent seeking and whatnot. I don't know if that's true. I'm not an intellectual historian, so I don't know exactly what the timing of these different statements are, but uh, there's definitely a similarity, right? And I do know that in the 20th century, a number of people in the, in the classical liberal tradition tried to revive this. Um, I've seen Austrian economics journals run the occasional article on this. And there, you know, in the same way that a Marxist would say, well, you know, who, how are things produced, right? Then that's gonna tell you what the classes are in society. You know, some classical liberals will say, who has the political power? And now that creates a structured uh, class system. Um, you know, but then that begs the question of how useful class analysis is overall. And I think that's an interesting discussion, which maybe we could do in the chat group later this evening, which is, um, you know, is it worth pursuing? Because even a lot of 20th century sociological Marxists, like Eric Olin Wright, you know, he spent a lot of time trying to fix Marx, right? Like he spent a lot of time saying there's more than two classes, or technically Marx said there was bourgeoisie, proletariat, lumpen proletariat in a small, uh, smaller petty, you know, smaller social classes. But, you know, he was like, and I'll talk about this later today, like there's lots of kind of economic phenomena that don't fit the system. So even if you were a socialist and you thought that markets were a suspect, maybe there's big class analysis is not the best way to pursue that uh, critique. So we have time for one more question. Uh, and this was a fun one. What would you recommend to undergraduate students who are forced to take a sociology class as part of their core requirements and are forced to sit and listen to Marxian theory? Um, <laughs> One is transfer to my class. You'll only get a couple weeks of it. Um, you know, it's, and I actually, I, I enjoy teaching Marx because I really believe ideas are important, even ideas I personally disagree with. Um, and to be honest, nobody's forced to take a sociology class. Like, there is no a university in the country, unless you're majoring in sociology, says you have to take soci, but rather some sort of general elective requirement that you have to take. And here's what I would say, which is uh, open, smile. Go to class and smile. Think very carefully about the theory, what its assumptions are, what the model of the world it presents, and really try to see things through their eyes, you know, to be a very charitable reader and listener. And at the very least, and I tell people when I teach Marx, like, I'm not a Marxist, but if you want to be a literate in modern society, uh, yeah, this is a major argument. There are many countries that adopted Marxism as their guiding philosophy. There are many academics who uh, endorse Marxism. They believe it is a good philosophy. And so let's listen to them. Let's see, what do they have to say? What's the empirical evidence? And, uh, you know, isn't that part of an education? You know, to, to meet people you think are maybe really incredibly incorrect, but to open your mind and say, okay, that's that. And then you have the next 40 or 50 years of your life or more to think about uh, rejoinders or responses to it. <laughs>